All right, our final student present presenter of the day is Alejandro Canalasso Caratero. Alejandro came to Scripps as an artist pursuing academic training in science. His admiration for art forms in nature has been growing since his early days, illustrating birds and insects. He has a passion for both the micro and mac macro scale of marine organisms. And for his project, he approached scientifically what has been his main creative source in recent years, whale anatomy. A couple of years ago, I don't know if it was maybe 18 months ago or two years ago, Risa told me a story of a prospective student who had come to uh, learn more about the program and visit campus and how he had mistakenly been let off in Solana Beach. And so he walked to Scripps from Solana Beach, which is a solid nine and a half mile walk. Um, when you're not expecting it, th that's ambitious. <laughs> he, he was, he, he, you know, was, was not shaken by that. I think he showed up probably a little bit sweaty, but he was excited. He applied and he certainly made an impact and we remembered uh, that story. And then flash forward to the admissions committee meeting when we were reviewing his portfolio and just being blown away by the fact that we had this fine artist who hadn't taken much in the way of science classes, but had painted these 30 meters or more murals of whales on the side of academic institutions and buildings in Spain where he lives, um, but as well as doing these detailed scientific illustrations of transverse cuts of a fish, as well as everything in between. So Alejandro wanted to come and beef up the science part of his education and his knowledge base, and that's exactly what he did. I mentioned in the introduction that he early on got to meet Anela Choi, and they sort of partnered up early in the program and were able to collaborate together, which I know has been not only a benefit for Alejandro in getting to really take a deep dive into um, everything that Anela can teach him related to deep sea biology, but also a real benefit to, to her lab as well. So I'm delighted that Alejandro is, you know, he's presenting remotely today because as I mentioned, he's quarantining and going on a research cruise, I think for a week or more with uh, Dr. Choi and her lab. And I'm just so grateful that Alejandro walked that nine and a half miles and made it to this program and did exactly what he set out to do, which was broaden his experience um, be able to apply his fine arts background in a disciplinary way, interdisciplinary way to this project. And the name of his uh, presentation today is A Tuning Fork of Extraordinary Size, Testing the Role of Gray Whale Mandibles in Bone Conduction Hearing. Thank you, Samantha. Um, I think I should mention that I walk, uh, I walk that distance on the beach and through a bunch of tide pools as well. And the tide was going in as well, which made it even more challenging. Um, anyway, mysticids is the group of cetaceans, which is commonly known as uh, baleen whales. They produce the lowest frequency sounds across all living mammals. These low frequencies are um, very effective for long range underwater communication because they travel very far distances. Just as an example, Scientists recording glacier and ice noise by the uh, coast of Greenland were able to record whale singing of the coast of Norway. So they travel, uh, these sounds travel uh, impressive distances. How much information is contained in, in these low frequency sounds that they produce is still unknown. Um, but we believe they use low frequencies for communication, possibly also for navigation. And there are certain species like the humpback whale that produces them during feeding. So from a marine conservation perspective, this um, raises some concerns because currently low frequency acoustic bands in the ocean are dominated by human activities. We humans produce a lot of noise in the, in the ocean in the very same frequencies that these whales used to communicate. We do it both actively through the use of sonar and passively as well, like shipping noise is the dominant source. So the extent of, of the impact of human noise in these whales is, is still unknown. And that is in part because we don't understand the mechanisms they use for hearing. 
and we don't know the frequency range they can perceive. So answering these key questions is fundamental in order to inform actions that can help mitigate human noise impact on whales. So the current hypothesis is that whales hear through the, through the skull, so basically through the bone structures in the head. Um, this, this is known as bone conduction, and it has been determined as the dominant hearing mechanism in the fin whale. So we wanted to test that hypothesis on the gray whale, and particularly for this project, we wanted to understand what is the role that the mandibles, that is the, the jaw bones of the, of the whale, play in the hearing mechanism. This is, a, this is the profile of a 10 hertz wave uh, underwater. It's produced by the blue whale, which is the largest animal that ever lived on planet Earth. It is inaudible to the, to the human ear. And underwater, these sounds have wavelengths of uh, 150 meters. That is about five times the total length of the whale. So the first intriguing question that comes up when, when we study uh, baleen whale hearing is how is it that they can perceive these low frequencies with a tympanic bone that I can hold in my hand? I, I'm not sure if you can see me well, but I'm holding the tympanic bone of a gray whale. That's the ear bone of the whale. And by comparison, it is about the size of my fist. So there is no way these long, long frequencies, these long wavelengths can vibrate this, this bone. The tympanic bone, which is represented on the water colors on the, on the right, is a thick and heavy bone that is fused to this delicate ossicular chain. And I say delicate because these, these ossicles, the, the three uh, bones of the ossicular chain, called the malleus, incus, and stapes, are the smallest bones in the body. So they are also these, these bones are in charge of, of hearing. When, when they vibrate, they induce hearing. So if the tympanic bone is moving, we can assume the whale is hearing something. The watercolor on the left represents the posterior view of the skull. This is the main element of the skull, the cranium with the foramen magnum that leads to the brain case. That's where the brain is. Um, these long structures projecting forward are the mandibles. These are the jaw bones of the whale. They are connected at the front by soft connective tissue. And at the back, they are connected to the squamosal bone of the skull by this element represented as a green wash, that is the temporomandibular joint. This is the key element in the project, and I'm going to show you that in a, in a moment. But anyway, it connects the mandibles to the skull right next to where the ears are. This is, these are the tympanic bones that are represented on the right. If we slice through the skull, we can look at the profile of that bone. We see that the highest density mass, which is called the involucrum, is at one end. And the bone itself hangs from the periodic bone of the skull by these extremely thin pedicles represented in magenta. These are these structures that project from the tympanic bone. So by looking at the profile of that bone, we understand it is made to vibrate. When we ask the question, how is it that baleen whales hear these low frequencies, we are asking, what, it, what are the mechanisms that enable those long, frequent, those long wavelengths to set these bones in motion? This is a lateral view of the skull. The theory is that these elements, the skull and the mandibles, are large enough to, to interact with those low frequencies, and that results in vibrations of these, these bones. And those vibrations, in turn, co cause movements of the, the tympanic bone. So we hypothesize that the mandibles are playing an important role in that hearing mechanism, based mainly on three things. One is the, the morphology of the bone, which is this, there are these large, heavy bones projecting forward from the back of the skull, about the same length of the skull itself. Second is the, the responses of these bones to acoustic uh, pressure to sound that we have seen in the simulations of the fin whale. They shake a lot and they move backwards and forwards and sideways. And then third is the connection, again, through this temporomandibular joint represented in green, the connection to the skull right next to where the ears are. So it is reasonable to think that any movement, the movements of these uh, bones will cause vibrations of the tympanic bone, which is represented in red there, 
and pointed with, with an arrow. So how can we test this? Well, we cannot do it in living specimens. We certainly cannot do it in the field, but we can uh, create a, com a computer model that simulates those responses. And that's what we did. We started by taking computer tomography scans of the head of a gray whale. Uh, what computer tomography does is it uses X-ray to take tomographic cross-sectional images in, the, in this plane in yellow, which is the transverse plane from the back of the head to the front of the head. Um, the benefit of doing that is that it allows us to create a three-dimensional reconstruction of the skull by assembling all those tomographic images. Uh, and that reconstruction is anatomically correct and has all the different elements. So the skull, the mandibles, the ears, the joints as independent units. The benefit of that is that we can then assign different elasticity values, different material properties to these, to these elements and see how they react to sound. And I mentioned before that the, that the temporomandibular joint that connects the mandibles to the skull is the key element, because what we did in this project is experiment with, with those material properties of that joint. We changed the, we changed the elasticity of that, of that joint. We, make it, we made it very, very soft to the point that it almost isolated the mandibles from the model. We make it very stiff, which made it bone. So um, if that is an element that is stiff, we understand that the movements of the mandibles are going to have an effect on the, on the tympanic bone. So the way the computer model works is we apply the finite element method to the three-dimensional reconstruction. The finite element method is a mathematical tool that subdivides the, the skull into independent elements, small elements called finite elements, which are these tetrahedra that interlock and form a mesh that surrounds the, the skull. So when we apply sound pressure to, to this area at the front of the skull and the mandibles, we can see how those finite elements start moving and interacting and bumping against each other and that uh, those movements get translated, like transmitted through the skull and through the mandibles and the tempor temporomandibular joint to the ears of the whale. Then we can zoom in on the ear and see what's happening. So going back to the ear of the whale, this again is the tympanic bone with the two pedicles projecting uh, upwards. This, these are the ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes fused here to the, to the tympanic bone. Represented in blue here are the fluids that fill the, the labyrinths of the inner ear. This is embedded in the periotic bone in the of the skull, and it has an opening that is the oval window uh, that is represented in red here. The, the way the hearing works is when these bones vibrate, that results in a pressure input of the stapes, this bone, on the oval window. So that pushing motion on the, on the fluids, that moves the fluid around. And here in the cochlea, the movement of the fluid gets translated by specialized cells into uh, electrical impulses of the, of the skull. So how can we assess the hearing sensitivity of the whale? Well, we place two landmarks, one on the tip of the incus here, represented in green, and one on the oval window, represented in red. And then we measure, as these bones are moving, the change in absolute distance between these two points. So how far and how close are getting to each other. And that basically gives us an estimation of what the stapes is doing, that movement that puts pressure on the, on the fluid of the, of the inner ear. And that's what we plot. So this plot represents the, the velocity of that movement of the stapes as a function of frequency. So we do a frequency sweep from 10 hertz moving to up to 600 hertz. So these are low frequency hearing. And the green function, again, represents that change in the distance that is represented as an arrow there. It's interesting that we get these two peaks in, in the hearing sensitivity just where just at the frequencies that the gray whale uses for communication, which is really interesting because this validates in 
away the, the model, we can see that it, it, the, the hearing results in, in the same frequencies that the, the wave produces. And then what we do is plot this sensitivity to different uh, values of the temporomandibular joints elasticity. So this is a medium intermediate elasticity, 100 megapascals. And by changing that joint, by making it very soft, for example, we, we understand or we think that the, that the uh, response of the stapes would be different because the vibrations of the mandibles would be playing a different role in the hearing mechanism. And that's what we did. So we um, tested a, a range of frequencies from very soft values of the temporomandibular joint to very stiff values, making it bone, basically. And we were some, we were um, in this experiment testing a range of frequency of a range of values um, that span about four orders of magnitude. And the interesting thing, the surprising thing for for all of us was that the functions were constant. So in a way, the somehow the, the movement of the mandibles is not having an effect in the in the hearing of the whale. And it is not because of the temporomandibular joint is absorbing those movements. So we think it's because uh, the movements of the skull, the way the skull is interacting with the sound, is in a way, in a way attenuating the, the movement of the mandibles. Anyway, these are pretty conclusive results. So because it's so constant, we can conclude that the mandibles do not play a role in the hearing mechanism of the whale. So we know they hear through the bones. What are the elements? That would be the key question now to ask. What are the elements or properties of the skull that enable that bone conduction hearing? Is it the shape? Is it are the particular bones in the skull that interact with sound and transmit the vibrations to the tympanic bones? Is it the way the skull is constructed? I'm going to leave it with that open question. I would like to thank all the members of uh, the committee of this project, Oriana Poindexter, Dr. Simone Bauman Pickering, Dr. John Hildebrand, Dr. Ted Cranford, the chair of the committee, Dr. Peter Crisel. Particularly, I would like to express my gratitude to Ted Cranford and Peter Crisel for the amount of time they have taken to to, take, to train me and, and teach me along the, along the way. I would like to thank Samantha Murray and Risa Farrell and all the other members of, of the Marine Biodiversity and Conservation Program, and my colleagues and fellow students at the Scripps. And finally, my, my family, particularly my parents, who support me um, unconditionally. And to thank you all for tuning in, I would like to play this sound of the gray whale, courtesy of Dr. John Hildebrand. Thank you very much. All right, can you hear me Alejandro? Yes, loud and clear. All right, so couple questions, although if there are any in the audience, feel free to raise your hand. First question, how do you account in the model for the soft tissues surrounding the skull of the whale? That's a great question. Thank you very much. And I'm glad you asked it because I normally forget to mention that. So all the simulations that we run, we, um, we simulate the skull being in a water medium. And what does that, what that does is like creates some constraints in the movements of the skull and that accounts for the soft tissues because um, if you think about all the soft tissues surrounding the skull, they are very varied. There are some that are connective tissues, some are like blood, there is air spaces, there is water. So if you average all those values, you get more or less the value of water. So that's how we account for, for all the soft tissues. Great. 
Uh, one more question. Why are you testing that particular range um, from, I think, 10 hertz to 500 hertz? What made you choose that range? So that's another great question. Um, so we are limited to that range because we want to make sure that this, the results that we are getting are um, feasible in nature. And in order to do that, we need to stick to principles, physical principles that have been tested and are known to work. In this particular case, we are um, following the principles known as Rayleigh scattering, which describe how a particle or an object, in this case the skull, is moving uh, in a medium as the sound is traveling through it. And for those principles to, to work in this model, we need to make sure that the wavelength of the sound is at least three times the length of the skull. So we can only, given the length of the, of the skull that we've got, we can only test for that range of frequencies. If we go higher, we might get results that might not be as accurate to, to natural principles as, as these are. Excellent. And then final question, Alejandro. I'm noticing there was a lot of excitement in the room about your bow tie. And I just <laughs> wanted to give you an opportunity to say anything about that, if you'd like to. Well, yeah, of course. Um, so this was the only way I could like dress properly in, in Zoom, really. And, um, I guess I could, could have wear a hat, but... A top hat. A top hat. <laughs> and, <laughs> And it was it's, it's handmade by by Ellery Porterfield, my girlfriend, and um, she made me this wonderful bow tie. So I had to wear it. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you very much.